So, hi everyone, thanks for joining. For those of you who joined here, for those on Zoom, and for those who will be later, I uh, would like to watch the recording of the talk. My name is Nimrod Osler. For those of you who are here, of course, uh, you know me since you're from uh, our program and the academic head of the program at, for in conflict resolution and mediation at Tel Aviv University. I'll say a couple of words about our program for those who are unfamiliar with the program, and then I'll move to presenting the findings of the joint surveys that we conducted lately. So the, our program here is a full MA program, which is uh, being conducted and held at Tel Aviv University for 10 months. And our program offers both uh, studying at Israel and staying in Tel Aviv, which is a wonderful and fun city. Not only when products are taking place at the Tel Aviv, um, it's also, it also offers a unique combination of studying both theoretical aspects of conflicts from a multi-perspective and multidisciplinary uh, look, looking from both political, psychological, international law aspects of conflict, studying both theories and <clears throat> taking that to practice through the workshop that we offer our students, the practical that they can do in uh, different organizations here in Israel, the tours that we're conducting in Israel in different places of interest to social and political conflicts in Israel. And for those who are more interested in research path, we also offer the possibility to conduct an MA thesis here in our program, as well as PhD. So you're all welcome to join and register to our program, those, for those of you who are interested in this fascinating, fascinating uh, phenomenon. I will be presenting here uh, my talk about two states, one state or dead end, which will be based on the Palestinian Israeli polls that we conducted in December 2022, together with my colleagues, Alin Shikaki from the Palestinian Center for Policy and Server Survey Research at Ramallah, with my colleague Dalia Shendlin, and with my colleague here from Tel Aviv University from the Political Science uh, School, Alonia Ktal. Uh, this survey was funded by the Netherlands Representative Office in Ramallah and by the Representative Office of Japan to Palestine. Um, and we thank them all for their continued support in this project. Let me first start by introducing our methodology and who were taking part in our survey. Our two samples were not done in the same way due to the difference between the Israeli and the Palestinian population, of course, and the different context in which each one of these population lives within. The Palestinian sample, uh, the poll there was conducted by um, my colleague uh, Khalid Kaki and his team was conducted through face-to-face -face interviews with uh, 1,270 Palestinians who live in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip. These were 127 randomly selected locations within these areas in order to make a representative sample of the Palestinian population in the occupied territories. The Israeli sample <coughs> included 900 adult Israelis that were interviewed by the internet, and it included uh, Jewish Jews who, lives, who live inside the Green Line, 500 of them, we had an oversample of 200 West Bank settlers and 200 Israeli Arabs or Israeli or Palestinian citizens of Israel. Of course, our data is weighted so it will reflect the actual proportions of each one of these groups in Israeli society. The data was collected by New Wave Research Center. And we as a team, of course, uh, analyze these data and these are the results that we offer to these, uh, um, to these polling. So let's start with the basic question of about the two-state solution, which is still considered to be the widely accepted, at least worldwide idea about how to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So what we can see here based on the current poll and on previous polls that we conducted in this project is that we can see here a very clear declining support for the two-state solution. Let me just move this away so we can see the data better, hopefully. So as you can see here, the support 
has declined from a peak of 71% among Israelis. I'm talking about the whole Israeli population, including Arabs and Jews. It has declined from 71% to 39%. It has also declined with more than 20 points among the Palestinian sample during the last 12 years from 57% support for the two-state solution to 33%, the lowest point um, in, the couple, in the last couple of decades. If we break that down for the populations which compose Israeli society, we'll be able to see that actually the level of support of Israeli Jews and of Palestinians in the occupied territories is almost identical. Both we're talking about only a third of them supporting the two-state principle. Of course, the population which rises up, pushes up the percentage of support for a two-state solution are, of course, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, which, by the way, you can see here, them, their level of support also dropped from a very high, almost consensus support for a two-state solution to 60% in our latest poll. While Israeli settlers has the lowest within those uh, groups, the lowest support for a two-state solution. Also interesting to see is the difference between the level of support for a two-state solution within the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Okay? And you can see here, maybe surprisingly, for those who are not engaged with polling within Palestinian society, is that support for a two-state solution is higher in the Gaza Strip than among the West Bank population. And we'll see some interesting uh, results about that later on. Now here, what I showed you is the support for a two-state solution as a principle. If we add to that, now what does it include exactly? We also asked our participants their level of support for a permanent status agreement while we detailed 11 components of that such a peace agreement, which includes mutual recognition and the end of the conflict, demil demilitarized Palestinian state without heavy weaponry, Palestinian sovereignty that also has Israel, Israeli uh, early warning stations, a multinational force that's supposed to guard the final agreement, border is based on the green line with equal territorial exchange. Two capitals in Jerusalem, both of Israel and Palestine, divided sovereignty in all city of Jerusalem, family unification in Israel of about 100,000 Palestinian refugees. Future Palestinian state will be democratic, guarantees by the US, Egypt, Saudi Arabia on the implementation of the agreement and for the agreement to be part of the regional peace according to the Arab Peace Initiative, okay? So that's the whole package deal of a two-state solution. And we ask also the level of support of our respondents to this, uh, uh, um, of the deal as a whole. As you can see here, the level of support also varies. And actually when we ask people about their level of support for a two-state solution for a package deal, it drops among, Palestin among Palestinians from 33% to 26%, okay? So that's difference. that difference is clear, right? Between the two questions, it's two different questions. While among Israelis, it, staying, it stays approximately uh, uh, the same, drops a little bit for Israeli Jews in three points. I won't go into too many details about the different divisions of who supports it more or less, because there are a lot of details about that. And if uh, you'd like, I'll be, I'll be glad to answer about that uh, in the Q and A. I can give you more uh, um, information about that. Of course, the clearest distinction is according to political ideology. And you can see here that Israeli political left is characterized by its support for a two-state solution. Also, there are high levels of support among, uh, uh, Jew among the Jewish center. While we can see here that for the Jewish right, there are very low levels of support for a two-state solution, something that nowadays also characterizes the uh, right. By the way, right-wing Israelis composes about two-thirds of Jewish Israeli population. Two-thirds define themselves right or moderate right. Okay. 
we look at that, okay? If you look at the data from the Palestinian uh, population, you can see here that the gap between West Bank and Gaza support widens in our current survey. And you can see here that while it was, the gap was uh, um, smaller here between the two population, support rates for the two-state solution went up a little bit in, at the, in Gaza Strip from our last survey, from our previous survey, and they dropped by seven points. Quite a, an interesting um, finding among West Bankers. I'll go over that quickly once again. If you have more questions, I'll be glad to answer that. What's interesting is that you can see that among all our populations, level of perception regarding the feasibility of the establishment of a Palestinian state in the near future, there is a big majority who don't think there are high chances of a Palestinian state to materialize in the near future. Not among Palestinian, Israeli Arabs, or Jewish Israelis. All perceive that chances as low or very low. You can also see the trend where both Palestinians, especially Palestinians, don't see uh, the two-state solution anymore as a viable option. 70% of Palestinians do not perceive the two-state solution as a viable option. You can see here there is also almost a majority among Jewish Israelis who do not see that as viable, but there are larger percentages. Uh, uh, the, the gap is, is smaller than between Palestinians, between those who think, think it's still viable and those who do not believe it's any more viable because of political changes, developments on the ground, such as some exp uh, uh, expansion and that make it impossible to implement. So what are the alternatives? Okay. We asked about several alternatives. What we can see here, we'll start with the democratic alternatives, as we call them. You can see here that we offer people and ask them about their level of support for a two-state solution, specific two-state solution package, as I said before, one democratic state for both Jews and Palestinians, and a confederation, which I'll explain a little bit later what exactly does that include. What you can see here is that all democratic options are in decline, okay? Levels of support for a confederation drops among Palestinians from 29 percentage in the previous poll to only 22%. Not very big difference among Jewish Israelis, but you can see here, interestingly, that there is no democratic solution today that receives the support of the majority of any of the publics, not the Israeli or the Palestinian public. No democratic solution gets a support of more than half. You can see here that most of them run around a quarter and a third only to support these ideas. The support for confederation includes the support for what we ask here, you can see here, two states, Palestine and Israel that enter into a confederation. Citizens of one country are allowed to live as permanent residents in the territory of the other. Each national group votes only in its state for elections. There's freedom, freedom of movement. Jerusalem is not divided. It serves as the capital of the two states. There is cooperation on security and economy. That's the idea of confederation. And you can see here, once again, that the level of support for confederation are very low among both people. We're talking about less than a quarter, only almost fifth of the population who support these idea among Israeli Jews and Palestinians. What about non-democratic options? Okay. So we also ask the level of support for one unequal state, meaning either Israeli dominated, this is what we ask Israeli Jews, whether they support an Israeli dominated one, a, a one state that includes only um, less rights for Palestinians, 
and the opposite for Palestinians, a Palestinian dominated uh, one state. You can see here that the level of support for one unequal state are about 30% among Palestinians and 37% among Jewish Israelis. And this trend, I will talk about that a little bit later on uh, towards the end of my talk, but the trend in which we can find among Jewish Israelis where we can see higher support rates for a one non-democratic state than for a two-state solution is something that we have seen uh, uh, in the last couple of polls that we conducted in the peace index. I'll talk a, a, a little bit more about that later. But you can see here that out of the different solutions that we offered, this is the one that, re that receives uh, um, the biggest support among Israeli Jews, although it does not uh, get the support of more than half. What about the annexation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? What about annexation with no full rights for Palestinians? As you can see here, among uh, Jewish Israelis, there is still a larger portion that oppose the annexation of the West Bank to Israel without full citizens' rights. But among Israeli settlers, you can see here that more than two thirds support this idea of annexation of the West Bank. So this is the state of the two state versus one state solution right now. And we also try to understand what are the current conflict directions. So what are the aspirations of Israelis? What are the aspirations of Palestinians? What do they see as the next step in the conflict? When we ask people, what is their aspiration? We also ask them, what do they think is the other group's aspiration? Okay, so we ask them, what in your opinion are the long run aspirations of Israelis? Or we also ask, for example, Israelis, we ask them, what do you think are the long run aspiration of the Palestinian Authority and the PLO? So we want to get a sense both of what people believe their group inspiration is, as well as what do they believe with the other group aspiration. What's very interesting here is that you can see that among Palestinians, there is no, there, there is no very clear leading aspiration. Okay, so we're among Palestinians. If you look at the at the purple bar, you can see here that there is also almost an equality between regain some territories conquered in 67, regain all territories currently uh, conquered in 67 or conquer Israel, destroy its Jewish population, all of them get the support of about a quarter of our poll. okay? If you look at the aspirations of Jewish Israelis, you can also see that it's not very clear. You have about a quarter which support annexation, nine political rights of Palestinians, about 22% withdrawal from part of the territories, only 18% extending borders of Israel and expanding Arab citizens, why third of the uh, uh, Jewish Israeli population say that they don't know what are the long run aspirations of Israel. Okay. But, more, but maybe something which is even more interesting is the perception of the other side. And what we can see here are very negative perceptions of the long run aspirations of the other side. Okay. So if you ask Jewish Israelis, what do they think? the long run of the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, the most common answer by 40% of Jewish Israelis is that the long run is not only to conquer Israel and regain control of the pre-1948 territories, but 40% believe that the long run aspirations of the PLO and the Palestinians is to conquer Israel and destroy its Jewish population. Okay? That's the most common answer. This is the levels of mistrust and negative perceptions which are that we have on the Israeli side. 
if you look at the Palestinian side, you can see here that once again, the perceptions are so negative that only 20% think that the long run aspirations of Israel is to annex, right, the, the West Bank. But 65% of them, almost two thirds of the Palestinians think that it's not only about extending the borders of Israel, it's also about expelling its Arab citizens. Or if you'd like, in other words, continuing the Nakba, okay? So you can see here, extremely negative perceptions of the aspiration of the other side of the conflict among both people. What about the next step? Okay, so we saw there's no, not very large support for a two-state, even those who believe and, and not believe, but support a two-state solution. You have a large majority that don't believe it's feasible in the near future. So what should be the next step? Okay, and what you can see here is that among Palestinians, there is some increase, not a very major one, but some, some increase so that the most popular answer is armed struggle against the occupation, while support for peace agreement with Israel drops from 34% in the previous, in our previous joint survey to only 31% in the current survey. If you look at the results by Jewish Israelis, you can see here quite a major decline from 41 who supported that the next step should be peace agreement with Palestinians to so only 30%, while a rise in support for a decisive war against Palestinians destroying their military capabilities rise to 26%, quarter of Jewish Israelis. So the next question, of course, is what do we expect next? And you can see here that most Jewish Israelis, as well as Palestinians in the occupied territories, think that the next thing that's going to happen is a new intifada. So when you ask them, given the wave of attacks by Palestinians on Israeli targets on both sides of the Green Line, do you think this is the beginning of a new organized Palestinian intifada? And you can see here that especially in the West Bank, there is strong perception that this is the path that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is currently taking among 68%, while in the Gaza Strip, it's only 51% that answered probably yes. But among two, among the two people, we can see almost a mirror image. Both of them agree that it's the beginning of a new Palestinian intifada. Another question that we ask our respondents is the way that they perceive the consequences of the ongoing occupation by Israel and armed, armed resistance by Palestinians. And here, I think there are also very interesting results in that sense. When you ask Israeli Jews, in your opinion, to what extent does the continuation of Israeli control over, the Palest over Palestinians in Judea and Samaria harm or do not harm Israel? So you can see here, that about 50%, half of Israeli population, think that the continuation of the occupation only slightly harm or does not harm Israel at all. Okay, half of, of Jewish Israeli respondents. But mo I, I would say what's even more interesting is that when we ask them to what extent does the continuation of Israeli control over the Palestinians harm or do not harm the Palestinians, right? So we also have a majority of Jewish Israelis who do not believe that the continuation of the occupation actually harms the Palestinians, okay? You have 52% who think it only slightly harms or do not harm Palestinians at all. We asked Palestinians about to what extent do they believe the continuation of armed attacks against Israel harm or do not harm Israel. And what you can see here is very interestingly that most Palestinians think Best majority of Palestinians, yeah, almost 75%, think that armed attacks against Israel harms, greatly harms, or harms Israel. When you ask them to what extent do they believe that their own attacks harms Palestinians, you can see here that a majority do not believe that these, uh, uh, that these armed attacks against Israel actually harm the Palestinians as well. Okay. 
So you can see here that the perception, if you'd like, um, if I can summarize that, that they believe that it's something that actually would be beneficial for Palestinians because it harms Israelis, but it's not something that harms them, right? So it's something that could rationalize the continuation of armed attacks. The same for occupation, right? If it does not harm Israel, and it also does not harm Palestinians in any way, mostly, so that's also a very strong rationalization of why, the, why to continue Israeli control over Palestinians in the occupied territories. Why, why are we there? Which developments, which kind of processes can explain these current developments in the conflict, the current perceptions of a two-state solution of one state, higher support for uh, undemocratic one-state solution among Jewish Israelis. So I'd like to give you a sense of some of the questions that are relating to psychological aspects of the conflict that we ask, and I think can explain to some extent the current situation in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We asked for a first time, how much do each group perceives the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, who owns the land, right? Now, intentionally, we didn't ask to what extent do they believe that Israel or Palestine belongs to one of the groups because the mere name, using the name Israel or Palestine already gives legitimation to one of the groups, right? So we ask about the territory. To what extent do they believe that the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River belongs to the groups Israeli, to the Jewish, uh, to Jews or to Palestinians? And what we can see here very clearly is an exclusive perceptions of ownership. So when we ask Jewish Israelis, to what extent does the land belong to Jews? You can see here that 93% thought it belongs to Jews. When you ask Palestinians, the exact same number, 93% perceive that land as belong to Palestinians. Okay, that makes sense. But we also ask them, to what extent do they believe the other side also owns the land, right? And this is what makes the perception exclusive because I can own the land, but if the other group owns the land as well, so we can share the land and we can share the ownership of the land. But what you can see here, is that this shared perception does not exist. What we can see here is very exclusive perceptions of ownership. Among Palestinian respondents, it's the same amount, right? 93% do not believe that Jews own the land at all, or almost at all, okay? While also Israeli Jewish respondents mostly relate to that land is owned exclusively by Jews, meaning 68% negated the idea that this land also belongs to Palestinians. So we can see here very clearly exclusive perceptions of ownership of the land. So that's one uh, aspect that could contribute to these current trends. Second one relates to victimization. We asked, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, to what extent do they agree or disagree with the, the following statement about their own group, right? Let's start with the second one. So we ask them, to what extent do they support the idea? They believe that the victimization for Jews, for example, yeah, the victimization of Jews is the worst compared to other people who, that suffered from persecution and injustice. You can see here, that 84% of Jewish Israelis thought that Jewish victimization is the worst. Unbelievably, a mirror image, right? So when we ask Palestinian respondents to what extent do they believe that Palestinian victimization is the worst compared to other people that suffered from persecution, it's the exact same number, 84%, right? So what's the, what's the moral lesson, we asked them, that was the next question, that each people, each group can learn from this perception of victimization. And we said, we asked them to what extent do they support 
the statement that since, for Jews, for example, since Jews are the victims of an ongoing suffering, is there more right to do anything in order to survive, right? And you can see here that 63% of Israeli Jews agreed with this statement. The level of support and agreement with such statement among Palestinians regarding Palestinians that their victimization gives them their, the moral right to do anything in order to survive, their level of support was even higher and reached almost a consensus of 90% agreement with this statement. So you can see here a very exclusive sense of victimization with moral entitlement, right? That our suffering gives us the entitlement to do anything in order to protect ourselves and to survive, right? I think that could be easily connected to the question that we asked about, do they perceive, for example, or the justification that I, a question that I gave you before to the justification of occupation, for example, from the Jewish side, or justification of for armed attacks against Israel in the Palestinian side. All of this is accumulated not in low levels of only on low levels of support for two state solution. Also, when we ask them about reconciliation activities, people to people activities, you can see here very low levels of willingness to participate in such activity in such activities in both sides. 30 percent, only 30 percent of Jewish Israeli respondents said they're willing to participate in a workshop that brings Israeli Jews and Palestinians together, same amount were willing to act in order to promote good relations between Israeli Jews and Palestinians. Level of support for such reconciliation activities are even much lower among Palestinians. Only 13 to 14 percent are willing either to take part in such workshop or even to promote good relations between the people. Okay, now we're not talking about political solutions anymore. What can we say as some policy conclusions and implementation, implementation, the implementations of these results? So first of all, we are standing at a time of no solution. There is an historic low support for the traditional two-state concept. Only a third total of Jewish Israelis support this idea. It is similar to the pre-Oslo era. Okay, so we went back 30 years in time on the level of support for the two-state solution, two-state idea. If we look at the context, we see that the chances for peace are very remote. There hasn't been negotiation between the parties taking place for many years. There are regular escalations between the parties last one of them taking place just in uh, recently during the Passover uh, holiday here in, in Israel. And we can see here, of course, the emergence of a extreme right-wing government in Israel. We can also say that this time of no solution is a consequence of Netanyahu's long-lasting rule in Israel. The idea that the, his low commitment to mutually accepted resolution and his institutionalization among the Israeli public of a conflict supporting narrative. All of this together with the consequences of the four years of the Trump era policies in the Middle East that did not promote in any way mutually accepted resolution to the conflict, all of that had extremely harsh consequences on Israeli and Palestinian public uh, uh, opinion. We can also see increasing legitimacy for permanent non-democratic regime in Israeli public discourse. And we can see here preference for force rather than democratic uh, solutions on Palestinian side, especially with the rise for the support of these ideas in the West Bank. The West Bank, West Bankers has been, have usually been for years having much lower levels for using force against Israel than people in the Gaza Strip. 
city in the Gaza Strip has a, have a very interesting mix of high levels of support, higher level of support for compromise together with support for uh, violent attacks against Israel. In my interpretation, it means that they most of all, they want to change the status quo in either way, either promoting a political solution or escalation. They don't want to keep their status quo in the same place. People from the West Bank used to support compromise to a little bit uh, a lower level than West Bankers, but they had low levels of support for violence against Israel. What was happening, what's, ha what's taking place, the violence that has been taking place in the West Bank, and the escalation of measures taken by the Israeli army against Palestinians in the West Bank in the last couple of months, by the way, starting before the current Israeli government, by the previous Israeli government, has taken its toll on West Bankers, highest toll in human lives since the Second Intifada. And that has uh, influenced dramatically public opinion in the West Bank with higher levels of support of violence against Israel. What can be done nowadays? At least in principle, maybe that's time that a leadership, a top-down driven shift in public opinion should be made. But at this point of time, we don't have this kind of leadership who can convey this change, right? So there is a need for a legitimate leadership on the Palestinian side. And there is need either for incentives or much stronger international pressure on Israeli leadership to be willing to promote these ideas again. And I would like to end by saying that another possible option, of course, relates to the current democratic campaign in Israel. The support for democracy in the face of the democratic the, the try to overhaul the democracy in Israel. If there will be a linkage and people will be able to create a linkage between Israel, the, Israel's democracy and resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, maybe that could be an opening for change in that, in, in that sense as well. And if we look, and I will end with that, if we look at the latest poll that we conducted in the Peace Index, the Peace Index is a poll that has been conducted at Tel Aviv University, a nationwide poll among Jewish Israelis, sorry, among the Israeli population, both Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis. This poll has been conducted since 1994. And it has been a monthly poll that has been conducted in Israel uh, uh, until 2018. Since 2018, it's conducted between two to four times a year. So in the latest peace index that we have just published a couple of days ago, you can see here a reverse in trends. So these are results from the peace index, not from the uh, joint uh, Palestinian-Israeli pulse. okay? So if you look at the latest results from the peace index, you can see here that the level of support for a two-state solution has dropped, right? From 45 to a low of 34%, very similar to what we found in the pulse, right? Levels of support for annexation has been on the rise and in not the latest, but the poll that we had on July 2028, 20, 2022, we had the exact same levels of support for a two-state and for annexation. But in our latest poll that we conducted just about a month ago, we can see a reverse in that trend again with a 10% uh, uh, gap opening up between levels of support for a two-state solution that have increased a little bit and levels of support for annexation, which has decreased, right? And we're talking about a right, extreme right-wing government in power in Israel. So maybe that's a place to hold. If we look at public opinion, it's early to say, it's only one poll that we conducted that shows such trend, but maybe the, what I told you, the uh, democracy campaign in Israel will mark also some hope for the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Thank you very much. And I open the floor for your questions. If uh, those of you who on Zoom would like to uh, join in a question as well, so you are welcome either to uh, write that on chat, or if you'd like, you can 
and raise your hand and I'll open your mic, open the mic in order to be able to answer your questions. Yes, please. We may have touched on it a little bit, but I'm kind of curious. What are your thoughts on this? So we've seen a little bit of a difference between uh, Palestinians in Gaza and Palestinians in the West Bank. Can you maybe go a little more in depth of why there is a difference of opinion between those two areas? Okay, so uh, Sean has asked me about the, the gap that we saw in, in the public opinion in, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. So let me go back a little bit to the data to show you some of the questions and what you can see here. Okay. So you can see, as you can see here, the, the gap has widened. You can see here that among Palestinians support for the peace package uh, uh, in the West Bank has gone up to up to 42%, right? While in Gaza, we could see even level of support for a peace package of up to, up to 50%, half of the population, and that wasn't so long ago. That was on June 2018, because five years ago. The decrease uh, uh, among support rates in Gaza is also, we can see here in the West Bank, but much larger uh, in the West Bank. So that's one thing that we can see about the, about the difference between West Bankers and Gaza Street. Um, uh, where did I have another slide with these uh, findings? Yeah, so you can see here the levels of support for a peace package uh, among West Bankers has dropped to 18 and the Gaza Strip 38. How can we explain that? I believe that the escalation that has, that has taken place in the West Bank, uh, which has started before the latest Israeli election campaign, uh, with the largest number of casualties among Palestinians in the, in the West Bank since the Second Intifada, has, uh, has been a destructive development in the West Bank. So, from what I heard from my colleague Khalid Kaki, levels of support or trust in the Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas has not dramatically decreased, right? But the levels of opposition to Israel, because of the escalation that has taken place in the West Bank, has increased dramatically, right? So the levels of, of opposition in the West Bank means that the support for a two-state solution or a peace package has dropped dramatically on the one hand, and there has been a increase in support for the use of violence. I think people in the West Bank, after the uh, uh, current escalation round, has lost their hope in political solution. And that was the fertile ground for the uh, popular developments such as the, the growth of the Lions Den, right? Or other armed groups in the West Bank. Um, while at the same time, there is no very major destabilization de 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 of the Palestinian Authority, right? So we're talking about majorly about the development of a very strong opposition to Israel and to the occupation in the West Bank, something that has been more, I would say, they, they had, I would say, very carefully, a little bit more of a normal life than people in, in the Gaza Strip, right? Who wants to change the status quo. That has changed as well for West Bankers who do not believe that their situation right now is stable in any way. Other questions? People though, on Zoom, you can also, if you'd like, um, you can unmute yourself and, and uh, ask questions if you have. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question relating this slide that was showing like both groups answering about uh, their entitlement to the land and for themselves and also for the other group. But it made sense when uh, Palestinians were answering in both, like uh, they would believe they were, it was theirs, I think 95%. And then they say like, it's not, yeah, exactly. 
but then I don't find a reason why like Israelis would change their opinion after to say like uh, it increases decreases when they 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 say uh, when it, well it changes it right. You're talking about the, the difference yeah. here in between Israeli Jewish respondents answer to whether the land is also belong to Palestinians and Palestinians answering to what extent it belongs to Jews. You're asking about this difference? Why is it not this the difference? difference between Israeli Jewish respondents uh, that it belongs to Jewish and then the Israeli Jewish respondents. To what extent does it belong to Palestinians? Palestinians? Yeah. Okay, so in the Palestinian case, you can see that it's exactly the same number, right? So Palestinians believe that the land belongs to them and it does not belong at all to Jews, right? Mm -hmm. Among Jewish Israelis, 93%, right? Uh, uh, there is a consensus that the land belong, the land belongs to, to Jews, but there is a small segment, about 25%, that by the way, they don't say it belongs to Palestinians, right? It's a very small segment of a 6% who say that it belongs to Palestinians as well, but they're somewhere in the middle. They're willing to say it maybe to some extent belongs to Palestinians as well. They're willing to, I would say, entertain this idea, okay? Now, if you take into account that about 12 to 14% of Jewish Israelis define themselves as left, right? Out of that, moderate left will be about half moderate left and half, half left. So this is what we remain with people who define themselves as left in Israel, 6%, right? I, I can't tell you if this is exactly, right, the same people who define themselves as left, but this is the similar number. People who define themselves as left would probably be willing to say that the land belongs to, to Palestinians as well, right? A little bit more people from the left moderate left and center will be willing to say, to admit that the land belongs to some extent to Palestinians, right? There is some room for that. Among Palestinians, there is almost no room for entertaining the idea of shared ownership in any way. Okay. Yes. Um, I think in one of the slides, it showed that the support for confederation was much lower than the two state solution or the one state solution without Israelis and Palestinians. Do you suppose, I mean, the, the, the one state solution and two state solutions are widely known and I mean, talked about and talked about, while the confeder confederation is pretty much non existent in the Israeli discourse. Do you suppose that has something to do with the fact that there's so much, so little support for it? And if there was more awareness of this possibility, then People, or, or is it something inherent about that particular solution that people don't like? So it's a good question. You know, I, I would say that if people were not, were just unfamiliar with this option, right? So you would say you would have uh, uh, low levels of support, but also maybe high levels of people who say, I don't know, right? Um, but you can see here low levels of, of support and high levels of also, it doesn't show it here, but also high levels of disagreement, of opposition to this idea. I would say that the, those who support two state are probably also those who will tend also to support the idea of a confederation. Probably since the level of support for a two state, for a two state solution are historically low in the Israeli public, there is people who do not perceive these maybe things that they will look as, you know, variations, right? It's, it's, it's a variation of the two-state solution. So it's not something dramatically different. If we ask about specific things out of that, right? Uh, uh, so freedom of, maybe you can see here. Uh, so among Jewish Israelis, the highest levels of support will be that there will be a right of return of Jewish diaspora and Palestinian refugees. Wait a second, that's yeah, and and Palestinian refugee citizens of each state, right? So Jew, Jewish Jewish pe Jewish people from the diaspora will be able to come back as they do right now to Israel. Palestinians will be able to come back as citizens of their own country. You have that's the highest level of support among Jewish Israelis. It's only twenty five. While you can see, oh, sorry, the Joint Civic Authorities is the highest, of course. Sorry. Uh, joint Civic Authority is the highest among Jewish Israelis, and it makes sense because it's actually the current situation, 
right? So we're talking about joint economical uh, um, and joint um, as well as a, a joint responsibility about security, similar to what's taking place right now. So this is something which does not threaten, threaten Jewish Israelis to that extent. But if you look at things which are shared capital, uh, um, as well as things which are basic, basically based on the idea of 67 borders, but open borders, this is something that I believe it does not does not create something which is dramatically new for Jewish Israelis that they perceive as something which is you know, uh, inherently different than the two-state solution. So it's a combination of both. People don't know a lot about that, but even, even if you give them some details, probably their perception will be, well, it's a two-state, it's a two-state solution, but something that we less that we're less familiar with. So there are even lower levels of support to go with that. That's my guess. Yes. Um, so you, you broke up Israeli Jews into a number of different groups, you know, left, um, moderate, and right a little bit. Um, I'm curious, um, like in your experience, sort of qualitatively, uh, are Israeli Arabs politically fairly um, monolithic, or do they have similar uh, splits in the group? Okay, so let's see if I have these right here. No, not so much. I don't have here detailed detailed um, data about about Israeli Arabs. Question was whether the uh, Arab citizens of Israel are a monolithic political group. Or there are also there are divisions in, in that population uh, similar to Israeli Jews. So first of all, there is there are there are variations inside the um, Arab society in Israel. Not so much around the question of the two state solution. Okay, among them, the two state solution is used to be a consensus that everybody united around. Is something that would probably also serve to uh, assist in some extent resolving their own identity conflict between them being both Israelis and Palestinians, and that would, would create some kind of solution for that. Nowadays, we can see also a, a decrease in their level of support for a two state, but still there is a clear majority among Israeli Arabs around this topic. So the divisions among uh, Arab Israelis are not along the lines of the two-state solution. Also, by the way, when you ask them whether, to what extent they uh, uh, define themselves as left, right, center, we have to understand that Israeli Arabs do not necessarily define themselves as left. They have a different perception about left, right, and center. And this is why their answers to whether they are on the left, center, or right spectrum do not reflect the same thing as for Jewish Israelis, right? So people who define themselves as right will probably be more uh, uh, traditionalists, but it does not relate to the answers and to their opinions about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Any other questions? From those who joined through Zoom, if there are any questions, please feel free either to uh, open your microphone and ask a question, or you can write through a chat. Hi, sorry. Hi. I don't know whether you can hear me, but I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I was wondering in the slide where you asked about whether Palestinians and Israelis, uh, like what they think about who the land belongs to, I was wondering if it would make a difference if you asked like, and instead of say, asking Israelis, does the land belong to Palestinians? Asking, does the land belong to both? Because I feel like, for me at least, I think it would make a difference if someone asked me, does it belong to someone else? Or does it belong to both of us? Right. Do you so, think asking, yeah. So, so I'm, I must emphasize that the question, uh, I'll share screen again.
So the question was not exclusive, meaning when we ask people to what extent the land belongs to each group, we gave them the possibility to choose the option that it belongs both to Israeli Jews or to Jews, sorry, and to Palestinians. They didn't have to choose one group. They could choose as well that the land belongs to a high extent, both to Palestinians and to Jews. And that means it's a shared ownership because both groups uh, um, have a high uh, ownership of the land, right? So it, no, it wasn't exclusive. It was not one continuum that on the one side it belongs to Jews, on the other side it belongs to Palestinians. There was one continuum to what extent does it belong to Jews and another scale to what extent does, that be, does the land belongs to Palestinians. So the meaning of shared ownership is that it belongs to both of them, right? To a high extent, both to Jews and to Palestinians. But we can see here that among, among Palestinians, this idea of a shared ownership that both of them share, right? Both of them own the land was almost non-existent and among Jewish Israelis, it was only among a small minority. Like, I understand that, but I'm just wondering, like, if it would have made a difference if you said, had said, like, instead of having, like, the binary, I know it still means that it belongs to both, but saying, like, okay, to what extent does the land belong to both Palestinians and Israeli Jewish people? Because I feel like it makes a difference. So, like saying well, in the, in, right. the, in the question, saying both. You know what I mean? Yes. So the question that you raise, of course, can be examined empirically. Uh, so I don't have a, a, an empirical answer for that because we didn't give that choice. But what I can tell you uh, from a paper which is. Um, under review right now and hopefully will be published soon is that we could see different profiles of ownership among Jewish Israelis and among Palestinian citizens of Israel. Okay, so while among Jewish Israelis we could see either one of two profiles, the dominant profile, what we could see here, an exclusive ownership, and the much less dominant profile of shared ownership, among Palestinian citizens of Israel we could find various profiles, including a profile of shared ownership, meaning that both groups share the uh, uh, land to a large extent, both of them own the land, sorry, to a large extent. We had another profile, of course, which was exclusive, that Palestinians own the land, Jews not at all. We had another profile that was out-group ownership, right? That they thought, Palestinian citizens of Israel, thought that the land belongs to Jews more than to Palestinians. And that, of course, you can also ask, maybe it does not mean that they think that's the right thing, but this is what they think actually is in reality right now, that the Jews actually own the land right now from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. So it's also a question of how do you interpret, how do you interpret this question in that sense, right? Whether on reality, it belongs to one people or on the principal level, who should be the owners of the land. So you can see here that for Palestinians in the occupied territories, the answer was very clear. It was about the legitimization of who owns the land. For Palestinian citizens of Israel, when we asked that on a different poll, the answer varied and it was different. So the meaning of the shared ownership varied there as well. Okay, thank you very much all for uh, listening and for taking part in asking the questions. Um, please keep uh, uh, following our peace index. Hopefully also a joint poll will be conducted in uh, another year or two again. And hope to see you in our program as well, Conflict Resolution and Mediation at Tel Aviv University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.